ask you how you would fill in this blank. I'll be happy when. How would you fill in that blank? I'll be happy when. Some of you are getting ready to go back to school in a few weeks, and so you're thinking, I'm not happy that school is starting back. I'll be happy when I graduate from school. That's the, that's the pinnacle of happiness for so many students. When I finally finish my high school education or my years in university, then I will be happy. And then once you graduate from school, you begin to realize there's more to life than just getting through school, right? And now we need a J-O-B, a job. And so you say, I'll be happy when I get a job, or maybe I'll be happy when I get my school loans paid for, or I'll be happy when I get that promotion. Some people say, I'll be happy when I, when I uh, have kids, when I get married, marry the man of my dreams or the woman of my dreams, then I'll be, finally be happy. And sometimes you marry that dream boat and he turns out to be a nightmare. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> and you think, well, maybe I would have been happier otherwise. And then you say, well, well, I'll be happy if we can have children. If we can just have some little ones in the house, then I'll be happy. And then God sends a, a, a bundle of children and parents of teenagers sometimes say, I'll be happy when the kids grow up and move away. Then I'll finally be happy. I was saying this to one guy once. He said, Mine's, my, my son is like 32. I've offered him good money to go and can't get him to leave. Sometimes we think that way. I don't know, maybe, maybe you've come in today and, and you rolled in here on four bald tires and a roll of duct tape. And you said... I'll be happy when I get a new car, if I could just get a new vehicle. My point is, there are a lot of things, right, that we think if I can just accomplish this or reach that goal or have that, then I'll be happy. Uh, in his book, uh, which is aptly entitled, by the way, Happiness, uh, Randy Alcorn says this. He says that many people spend their lives waiting to be happy. But anyone who waits for happiness will never find it. Joy, he says, escapes us until we understand why we should be joyful. We change our perspective and then develop habits of joy. I love that phrase, until we develop habits of joy. In other words, what Randy Alcorn says is what the cover of your handbook says, we need to choose unwavering joy. So I want to welcome you into the third week of this little study through the book of Philippians that we're calling Rejoice, Choosing Unwavering Joy. Now, let me just remind you of where we began this series because we began in the last chapter of Philippians by looking at Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 4. Let me remind you of this both invitation and command, verse number four says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. If you were here in week number one, you'll remember that we rearranged the words in that verse just a little bit so that we would really clearly understand it. Here's the invitation, here's the command, always rejoice in the Lord. Always rejoice in the Lord. So do you remember, this is the way life happens, right? It's a, it is a series of valleys and mountain peaks, another valley, the next mountain peak, another valley, another mountain peak. That's the way life goes. It's up and down circumstantially. But Jesus is that unchanging, unwavering, solid, the same yesterday and today and forever, that unchanging line, that unchanging foundation where we can rejoice. So Paul doesn't say in four, chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord as your circumstances are good or rejoice in your situation. But he says throughout all the situations of life, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he repeats himself, affirms it, reaffirming it. I'll say it again, rejoice. So over the last two weeks, we've learned a couple of things about how it is that we can choose unwavering joy. Let's do just a moment of review. Turn to chapter 1 and verse number 6 where we found this encouraging statement about the faithfulness of God. Philippians 1 and verse number 6, Paul says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, it's the work of grace, 
he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Everybody say it out loud. He will do it. Say it. He will do it. God started something in you and me. And Paul encourages us to know that he will finish his work. We learned as long as we're breathing, as long as we're still breathing, God's still working. And we can rejoice in that because he's not finished with us. I rejoice in the fact that I can know that God is still at work. Last week in chapter 1 and verse 21, Tim Brady did such a great job reminding us of the second uh, point of rejoicing. The second choice we make uh, so that we can have a life of rejoicing is to be reminded, chapter 1 verse 21, that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I choose Christ as my highest purpose and I look forward to the day when my greatest gain will be to be with him forever in heaven. It's not that I choose to live my life now and that's my greatest gain when I get to heaven. No, Christ is my life and I will one day see him. For to me, to live is Christ, that's my purpose, and to die is gain. So here's the equation that we've learned so far in two weeks. Two, a two-part, a plus-plus equation, okay? So the first part is simply to say, God's got me, right? He started to work, he's going to finish it. God's got me, that's the first part. Second part is, I'm choosing to live for Jesus. I, I, he's my highest end in life. To me to live as Christ is, uh, for me to live as Christ and then to die as a game. God's got me, plus I'm living for him. That equals unwavering joy. That's the equation so far. God's got me, I'm living for Jesus. That equals unwavering joy. But is life really that simple? I mean, really? Is it, is it that simple to say, if God's got me and I choose to live for Jesus, I'll always have unwavering joy? Are there things in life, that are there realities that we encounter that complicate that equation just a little bit? How about the reality of people? Do you have any people in your life that cause your life equation to be a little more complicated than that? If, have you ever said, life would be great if it were for all these people? <laughs> Sometimes we have relationships that create a bit of complication in our lives. Of course we do. What about um, work and worries and the pressures of life. Those complicate the equation a little bit, surely. What about this old flesh that we live in? What about our temptations, our struggles and our failures along the way? Does that complicate the equation of joy at all? Sure it does. What about the disappointments that come along in life and the frustrations that we have and the concerns that we carry and the worry that we sometimes deal with. All of these things, part of that flow of life, complicate the equation just a bit. Now, they don't, they don't uh, undo the equation, but we have to know how to respond and what choices to make in light of those complications. So we're going to read the text today in chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and you'll immediately recognize the passage, and many of you will immediately be able to know where Paul is going with this, Okay. So let's read it beginning in chapter 2 and verse number 1. Philippians 2 uh, verse 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort in his love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels and mercies. Now when the King James uses the word bowels, it's talking about your, it's ta the word means compassion. It's this idea that you feel it in your gut. Any compassion. Uh, in Christ, any mercy from Christ. Verse number two, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each of you esteem others better than themselves. I want you to I want you to underline a couple of things. Maybe circle a couple of words in verse number three. Um, circle the word each. Let each of you esteem 
others better than themselves. What you have in verse number three is a command. Let each of you esteem others better than themselves. Now look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse five, let this mind or attitude be in you, the same attitude which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But Jesus made himself of no reputation. Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant. Jesus was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the likeness or fashion as a man, Jesus humbled himself. Won't you underline that? Circle that. Highlight that. Draw arrows to that. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, as a result of that, because of that, God also then hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want you to do something real quick. Take your hand, touch your knee. We're not doing a dance, but touch your knee, all right? That knee that you're touching, here's what you should know. God has declared one day those knees that you just touched will bow before Jesus Christ. And everybody take your finger and touch your tongue. That, you say, I'm not touching my tongue. I just shook 12 hands. That tongue, God has declared, will one day confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. One day you will say, Jesus, you are Lord. And when you say it, it will be to the glory of God the Father. This has been determined by God Almighty that this will happen, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to talk to you about this passage today because it becomes apparent by uh, what we read and what we circled back up in verse number three when Paul talks about each of us relating to the others of us in a particular way. Verse number three, let each of you esteem others of you better than themselves. Verse four, look not every man on his own things, but everybody be concerned about the things of others It becomes apparent that Paul is teaching us how to choose to rejoice in a world where we live in relationship. To choose to rejoice in the context of or in the midst of relationships. I want you to write this down. Let's understand it from the passage. He's teaching us here what it looks like for us to choose joy. We're choosing joy in our relationships. We're choosing joy in our relationships. By the way, You know, we all choose things in how we relate to one another every day. All of us do. We make choices about how we relate to our wife, our husband. We we choose how we relate at work, what our interpersonal relationships are like at work. We we choose how we relate to our church. All of us every day make choices about how we relate to people. Some people choose to always be right. They are right. They choose that they are right every single time, even when they're not. They choose that they are. Some people make that choice. Some people choose they have to be first. They have to be served in everything. Some people choose to manipulate others. Some people choose to walk in humility toward others. We all make choices every single day in our relationships. Paul's going to teach us in this passage how it is that we choose joy in those relationships, how we choose to respond in those relationships so that the equation, the outcome, will be joy. Now, before we get into those choices that we make, can we agree together that no two relationships are the same? Do you agree with that? Every relationship has its different nuances, and, and no relationship is the same. So here's the thing, some relationships, and thank God for these relationships, some relationships are easy, right? They're just easy. I mean, they're they're loving and they're kind and they're encouraging. You love these kinds of relationships. Paul had that kind of relationship with his young 
protege, Timothy. In fact, look at chapter number 2, verse number 19. He talks about Timothy, one of the many places in his letters that he does. Look at Philippians 2, verse number 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus, or Timothy, shortly unto you. Verse number uh, 20. For I have no one so like-minded. There, there's no one in my life who, who we think alike. We, 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 we share the same heart. I have no man so like-minded who will naturally or genuinely care for your state. For all people seek their own way, except Timothy, he's saying. Everybody but Timothy seeks their own way rather than the things which are Jesus Christ's. But you know the proof of him. You know the testimony of Timothy, that as a son with a father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Timothy was one of those guys, all of us have friends like this, relationships like this. It's just our brother. It's our sister. It's that person your heart is joined and you, and you recognize the, the easiness with which you get to relate to that person. Praise God for those. Then there are other relationships that are what I would call needy. They're, they're, these people are needy in our lives and we're needy in theirs. Now, that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the relationship. It's just the nature of the relationship or the nature of the person. There's a lot of burden or needs that comes along with that. Look at chapter 2, verse 25. Paul had this kind of relationship with Epaphroditus. Chapter 2, verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you or send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, my fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered unto my walks. Now, Epaphroditus had come from Philippi. He had brought to Paul a love offering from the church in Philippi. He had brought it to Rome where Paul was under house arrest. And, and now Paul is sending him back. We don't know for certain, although I tend to believe that it's the case, that Epaphroditus was in fact the pastor of the church of Philippi. It's indicated in verse 25 when he says, your messenger. The word messenger is used in the Bible on more than one occasion to refer to the, the pastor of a local church. But whether it was the pastor or not, he was from Philippi, from that church, someone that they loved. Look at verse 26. For he longed after you all and he was full of heaviness because you had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, even almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I have sent him therefore more carefully, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his own life to supply your lack of service toward me. Now here's the point. Epaphroditus was a friend of Paul's. He was a friend of the church at Philippi, but he was enduring some illness. There was a sickness and the burden that came along with that. Sometimes we have relationships where there's an, a great need associated with the relationship. Again, it doesn't mean the person's bad or that we're bad. It just means that there's, there's a neediness. Maybe it's an emotional neediness. Maybe it's a physical neediness. Maybe somebody who struggles relationally. They're not, they're not evil people, they're not bad people, they're not unkind people, but they're just those people in our lives where there's a neediness, a heaviness that comes along with, with being in that relationship. Some relationships are that way. Some are easy, some are needy. The third kind of relationship is that some are just difficult. Do you agree? There's some relationships that are just, they're just some people tough to love. Can I get a witness? Amen. Help me here. Don't leave me hanging. Some people are <laughs> tough to love. Sometimes I'm hard to love. And, uh, and sometimes we're all difficult to love. And, and Paul had relationships with those kind of people as well. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 2. Therefore, my bre Verse number 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Now, you have to understand this scroll, this letter is being read in the church at Philippi, aloud in front of the congregation, this letter from the apostle Paul, sitting in the crowd are two women, one named Euodia, the other, Syntyche, and suddenly they hear their, their names called out. And they must have thought, Paul's mentioning us. And yet it was a rebuke. This would be a bit embarrassing for these two. I beseech you, Odia and Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Here's what he says. You two stop arguing. 
You two quit being contentious and fighting with each other and those around you. Don't raise your hand, but is there anybody in your life where the relationship is just difficult? You just can't say the right thing. You just, every time you walk through the room, it's like I'm on eggshells. Because there's a contention that's always there. We all have relationships with people like that. And, and sometimes we're that person. So here's the point I'm making. Paul dealt with it. We all deal with it. Some relationships are easy, praise God, for them. Some are needy. There are burdens that come with it. Some are just downright difficult. But Paul would say, in all of the relationships, regardless of what they're like, there is a path to finding joy, okay? The path is the same for all of them. And here's what he would tell us. Write it down. He says, if you want to find joy in your relationships, you need to choose to step toward each other. Now, this is, this is simple, but we so often forget it. Step toward each other. You know, so much joy just drains from our lives when relationships go sour, right? You know, if it's a marriage or a friendship or, or a relationship with our kids or siblings, whatever, maybe somebody at work, but somehow it goes sour, the relationship goes south, and, and this joy just begins, it's like somebody pulled the plug on, on the joy in our lives and it begins to run out. Sometimes relationships just get stale and, and the joy is lost. And so what we tend to do in those moments is we separate from one another, right? Our natural tendency is not to, to move toward one another. Our natural tendency is to separate. So what we do is we dig in our heels. We stake out our positions. And we begin to make our arguments about our, why we're right. It's kind of like, you remember in the old westerns where there would be a duel, right? Two guys are going to fight it out and they, they've got a subtle issue. And so they, they have a duel, right? They get back to back and that's one. They take 10 paces. And so they're 20 paces apart and they hit that 20th pace and they turn and they start shooting at each other. We all do this relationally. Now, not with a pistol, hopefully. But we do it with our words. Rather than moving toward each other, we step away from each other and then we turn and we start firing our shots. Paul says, look, in all of your relationships, when you have a difficult uh, relationship, what you should do is to step toward one another rather than away from one another. Verse number two, he says this, Philippians two and verse number two. Listen, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, that you be like-minded, that you have the same love, that you... Um, are, of the, are in one accord and that you have one mind. He says, when you have a difficult relationship, I want you to step toward one another and find, find like-mindedness. You may not going to agree on everything, but find a place where you have like-mindedness. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 15 where Paul uses this word in the letter to the church of Rome. Romans 15 verse number 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Where does the patience and the comfort come from that I can find like-mindedness with someone? I find it from the God of patience and consolation. Verse number six, that you might with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive one another, even as Christ also has received you in the love of God. He says, step toward one another, uh, find a way to be like-minded. He then says in verse number 2, back in Philippians 2 and verse 2, that we should have the same love for one another. Uh, the word same here is autos. It, it means reciprocal, that, that I'm going to love you and I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you to love me. And in this difficult relationship, I'm going to come toward you. And, and I want to join, I want to have the same mind. I want us to be able to think and agree together. I want, to, I want us to have reciprocal love for one another. And then he says, uh, being of one accord, having the same purpose. Uh, and again, he mentions the same mind. Step toward one another. So Paul would say, look, when you have a difficult relationship, step toward your wife, not away. When your marriage is tough, step toward your husband, not away. When, when, when you're in a friendship that's difficult, step toward that person. Don't step away from that person. 
This is what we should teach our children. When, when our children are arguing and fighting and, and doing what kids do, we teach them. You step toward reconciliation is always the goal. Now, if y'all are listening carefully, both campuses, I want you to shout amen. amen. This is what we need to learn. To the glory of God, reconciliation is the goal. In relationships, we want to move toward one another and step toward uh, our friend or our spouse. The second thing that Paul would say, if we're choosing to join our relationships, is that we need to step toward each other. And then secondly, we need to act in the best interest of your friend or your spouse or whomever it is. Act in the best interest, in their best interest. Philippians 2, verse number 3, let nothing be done. Let none of your interactions, none of your responses, none of your decisions... Nothing that you do regarding this relationship, let nothing be done out of strife or vainglory. Vainglory means empty conceit or selfish conceit. In your relationship, don't make decisions driven by your own conceit. In your difficult relationships, don't make decisions driven by, I'm going to win the argument no matter what. I'm going to be right. In these difficult relationships, he says, choose joy by acting not in your own best interest, but in the best interest of your friend or your spouse or coworker, whomever it is. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, verse 3 says, but rather in lowliness of mind. Now stop right there for a second. If lowliness of mind is the rather then what would be the opposite of lowliness of mind? Haughtiness of mind, right? So I can either act in lowliness of mind rather than arrogance or haughtiness or conceit of mind. Verse number three, let nothing be done through strife or or empty conceit, selfish conceit, but rather in lowliness of mind, let each of you esteem the others among us better than themselves. Wow. Now he says in verse number three, if you want to find joy in the midst of difficult relationships, here's where you begin. You begin by stepping toward finding a way to love, finding a way where we can think alike, and then beginning to behave in a way that is for the betterment of the other person. Begin behaving in a way that is considering, even esteeming or uh, determining that the other person has more value than I do. That's not self-deprecation. It's just simply a state of mind, a heart of humility, which says, I'm going to honor you above myself. Verse number three, determine the other person, esteem the other person of being greater value. And then in verse number four, now look not every man, every one of you, do not look on or consider your own interests or things, But every man should consider the interests or the things of others. If you want to have joy in your relationships, here's what he says. Look, God's got you. He's doing a work in you. He's not going to give it up as long as you're breathing. God's still working. You need to choose to serve Christ and live as Christ and die as gain. But I'm in this, this wavelength of life where I've got... All these relationships, and some are good and some are bad, some are contentious, and and what I need to learn to do is in all those relationships, I want to have joy, so I'm going to begin to step toward. I'm going to stop pulling back. I'm going to start stepping toward. I'm going to start coming in like this. I'm going to start coming in like this. I'm going to stop saying, you're the prop. I'm going to start saying, how can I, how can we come to the same mind? How can we reciprocate love for one another? And how can I esteem you better than myself? Now, you'll agree with me that all of these actions that are described in verses uh, 2, 3, and 4, all of these actions reflect an attitude of humility, right? All of these re- attitudes reflect an attitude of humility. So, so in your uh, handbook, here's the big idea. Write this down. What Paul is saying is if you want to have joy in your relationships, here's the big idea. The way up is down. That's the big idea. The way up is down. If you want to have, if you want to experience the heights of Christian joy, then the way you get up is that you condescend in a spirit of humility. If you want to experience the highs of Christian joy, then you need to stoop to the lower place in Christian humility. 
And I recognize, even as I'm preaching this, that I struggle with this in my own relationships, particularly in, in difficult relationships. And I recognize that what Paul is telling us is absolutely counterintuitive. It is. Nothing is more unnatural to us than what Paul is commanding us to do. And you may be thinking, how could I ever do that? Or maybe you're thinking, why would I ever want to do that? And so Paul gives us, in the remainder of this passage, um, two encouraging and enabling, not just encouraging us to it, but enabling us to do this. He gives us these two encouraging and enabling uh, truths. All right. So here's the first one. Write it down. He speaks to us, beginning in verse number one, about the power of Christ within us. Write that down, if you will. <coughs> Pardon me. The power of Christ within us. Now, I want you to think of verses two, three, and four that we've just read. In light of verse 1, which we haven't yet read, uh, except as we read the whole, the whole text, but look at verse number 1. If there be any, uh, therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of his love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any compassion and mercy. Now, somewhere out in the margin of your Bible, you ought to write the word since, S-I-N-C-E, not since, S-E-N-C-E. If you have any sense, write down the word since. Since we have in Christ these things. Not if. If we're in Christ, we possess these things. All right? So he says, since we have consolation from Christ. The word that's translated consolation in verse number one is the same word that's used throughout the Gospels to speak about Jesus as our comforter. It could be read, since we have the comfort of Christ. And the word that's translated comforter or consolation is the Greek word paraclete. It's the idea of one who comes alongside to help. He's got his arm around us. He said, now this is the way you do it. Walk like I walk. Step where I step. Do what I'm doing. That's what we have in Christ. So in your relationship, step toward, act lovingly, have the same mind, esteem the other better, act in their best interest. How can I do that? I do it in the strength and the comfort of Christ who does it through me, who shows me and teaches me and enables me to do it. If there is any comfort in his love, you know, the most uncomfortable thing that I might say to you is, in a difficult relationship, step toward that person, love that person, esteem them better than you, and act lovingly toward them. You might say, that's a very uncomfortable thing, Pastor, that you're asking me, that Paul is asking me to do. I get that. But he says in verse number one, but it's okay that it's uncomfortable because you have great comfort in Christ. Since you have the consolation, the comfort of Jesus Christ in your life, you're assured of who you are in him, then you can act that way toward them. If there is, since there is consolation in Christ and there's comfort in his love. And since there is, verse number one, the fellowship of the Spirit, the word means the partnership of the Spirit, since the Holy Spirit lives within you. You may say, Pastor, you, you don't understand my relationships. You don't get how I've been treated. You don't, you don't know how difficult that is. And you're telling me to step toward them instead of away. You're, you're telling me to, to consider them better than myself and to speak lovingly and to have one mind and to try to... You're, that's impossible, you may say. Here's what Paul would say. Is the Holy Spirit living within you? Do you have a partnership in your life where you're not operating in the energy of your own flesh, but you're operating in the divine, supernatural resurrection power of the Holy Spirit? If the Spirit of God lives within you, you can do what Paul is saying to do. He enables it. I, love, I have his love. I have his help. I have the partnership of the Spirit. I have, verse number one, the compassion and the mercy of Christ. I'm not going to get it right every day, but every day his mercies are going to be new. And what Paul would say is that it is this abiding and present, comforting strength of Christ 
which is my source of joy. I can have joy in a difficult relationship because my joy doesn't come from that other person. My joy comes from Christ who's with me. And so therefore, in the joy I have in him, I can act lovingly toward them. Paul says, look, I I get it. Some relationships are easy. Some are tough. Some are needy. Some are burdensome. Some are contentious and just difficult. But in all of them, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the strength of Christ. And you can act humbly toward others. Now, if the If the power of Christ is not enough to convince you, then Paul famously goes on beginning in verse number 5 and 6 all the way down through verse 11, and he sets the example of Christ before us. So he says, here's how you should interact, here's the power to do so, and now watch Christ. If you need a model of how how to act with humility, then look at the model of Jesus, verse number 6. He says, who being, speaking of Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, Christ humbled himself, and Christ, the Lord of life, submitted to death. Not just death, but the humiliating death of crucifixion as a criminal. He says, this is what Christ has done. As a result of that, he goes on to say in verse number seven that God has exalted him and declared that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Here's what you may not know. It is that many people believe that the verses contained in verse six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven are in fact part of a first century hymn that Paul didn't just write these words in his letter for the first time. That he was in fact including in his letter the words to a hymn which the Philippians would have already known and would have already been singing in their church. And these words, if they are in fact part of an ancient hymn, provide for us a beautiful model of what all church music today ought to look like. I was talking to Pastor Jonathan, our worship pastor, yesterday about this. What a beautiful Example of what church music should be. I'm so grateful for Jonathan's leadership and making sure this is the standard to which we sing as we gather to sing together to the Lord. But all church music ought to follow this form. It begins with with acknowledging and celebrating the eternal preexistence and glory of Jesus. He says in verse number six, who being in the form of God. If y'all are listening, shout amen. Amen. Jesus Christ existed eternally as very God in his nature, in his character, in his attributes, and in his glorious appearance. For eternity past, Jesus has always been very God of very God. Verse number six makes it clear who being in the form of, of God, this divine nature of Jesus. And yet he says in verse number six, who being in the very form of God did not think it robbery to be equal with God, meaning he didn't cling to that equality is what the word robbery means. When it was time to humble himself to come and be our savior, Jesus didn't say no way. He could have, by the way, he could have looked at what was in front of him, this humiliation, his condescension, his his death on the cross. Then he could have looked at me and said, that'll be a difficult relationship. I'm not going to go and do that for him. Jesus could have said, are you kidding, Father? Have you seen this kid, Jim Dykes? Have Have you seen this guy? Have you seen these people? Have you seen their stumblings and their arrogance and their, and their obstinance and their, and their carnality and their lust and their greed and their pride? And you want me to leave the highest place in heaven and go there and do that for them? No way. They're not worth that. And I would have to agree that we wouldn't be worth that. And yet, he who was in every way divine, very God of very God, did not cling to that that glory. But he says in verse number six, or verse seven, he made himself of no reputation. It means that he laid aside his glory 
If you can imagine for a minute my sport coat being the glory, the robe of the glory of Jesus Christ. Not the nature, not the divine nature, but the glory and the privileges of that divine nature. Jesus laid aside that robe and condescended. He came down to where we were. That is the greatest display of humility for the sake of a relationship that you'll ever see in all of eternity. He didn't cease to be God, but he laid aside the privileges of his glory. Made himself of no reputation, verse number seven says. He took upon him the form of a servant. He became a slave and he was made in the likeness of men. And so one day, one night in the darkness of Bethlehem and the dampness of a stable in the cold uh, room of a cave, The glorious, eternal, divine God of eternity sounded like because he became a man. And becoming a man, he goes on in verse number eight to say, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and submitted, became obedient unto death. By the way, the wages of sin is death. Nothing in this world ever died until sin entered into the garden. Sin came in, things began to die. The wages of sin is death. Jesus never sinned, so he wasn't swallowed up by death. He submitted. He willingly laid his life down, became obedient unto death, not just dying, but became obedient unto the humiliating death of a criminal upon the cross. Verse 6, 7, and 8 say that the most glorious, most exalted, most perfectly eternal and glorious personality in all eternity humbled himself for the sake of our relationship. Verse 5, read it. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Have the same attitude. Christ had. Do the same things that Christ did. Have the same willingness of humility. Let me ask you a question. Why did Jesus humble himself and go to the cross? Why did he die this death on a cross? Well, if your answer is say, well, because I'm really super special and he just, he just couldn't, he just couldn't get through eternity without me. And so he was willing to do what he had to do because I'm so worth it. Well, I would suggest that in in his heart of love for you, you were worth the sacrifice. But in our nature, in our true credit or credibility, we were not worth it at all. And his death on the cross was in the first place not about a union with us. It was about the glory of his father. And the glory of his Father would be exalted, would be, would be extended, would be magnified by the redemption of our broken lives and our union together with Christ. Let me read this to you out of the book of Hebrews. If you'd like to turn, you can. At least make a note in your notes and read it later. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2. The writer says, Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse number two of Hebrews 12 tells us that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. That he knew that his humiliation, his humility, and his condescension would ultimately result, not in the moment, Not in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sweat great drops of blood. Not in the nails in his hands. Not in the shame and humiliation of being condemned as a criminal. But ultimately, such humiliation for the sake of our relationship would resound to the glory of God. And that would result in eternal joy forever. For the joy set before here's what Paul says to us in our relationships. If you have difficult relationships, in every relationship, good, difficult, contentious, humble yourself. 
have the mind that Christ had. Humble yourself to elevate that other one. Because that, in the same way that Christ's humiliation ultimately led to his eternal joy, our humiliation ultimately will take us to joy. So it's a trade-off. You can have the short-term, temporary, I was right, told you so, joy. You can have it, but it's short-lived. Or you can, in the love and the strength and the power of Christ and following his example and having his attitude, love those that are difficult to love, humble yourself, consider them better, seek to, to, to bring reconciliation where it's possible in that relationship, but you can have that heart and ultimately you will have joy in heaven as a result of that. In fact, this is what Paul says if you keep reading in Philippians chapter number 2. If you, if you skip down to verse number um, 16, he says, Do this so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Verse 18, For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. Now I get it. The equation of joy is not, is not always easy. It is super simple. God's at work in me. He's going to finish it. I need to live my life for Christ and in the context of every relationship, seek to act in what's better for the other and esteem them higher and live with humility toward them. And as I do that, I will find joy coming in the short term, maybe not so much, in the long term, hopefully, in the eternal term, absolutely. But I do it in the strength and the power of Jesus Christ. Here's the right choice that I hope you'll make. Write this down in your notes. It is knowing what Paul has said today, I will follow the example of Jesus. That's verse 5, let this mind be in you. I will follow the example of Jesus by choosing the path of a humble servant. Though he was equal with God, he made himself of no reputation and became a servant. I will follow the example of Jesus by choosing the path of a humble servant, knowing that true joy comes from sacrifice rather than selfishness. True joy comes. Not when I act out of conceit and pride and selfishness and demand my way and I have to be right, but when I just humbly sacrifice even being right for the sake of the relationship and the glory of God, knowing that that will ultimately bring joy. We thank God for the easy relationships. We press on through the needy relationships and we love them and we thank God for them. The contentious relationships, we act in obedience. And we trust that God will bring us joy. Let's pray together.